Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming out tonight. Um, so you had a little introduction. I mean, everybody knows about Padma and who Padma is, but a few more things about her. This season of Top Chef will be her 13th. When it starts, any word on when the um, season starts? Later this year, I think, uh, before the year's out, but probably you know, really close to the holidays. I would say early December. You can tell they keep me nice and informed. So you're, <laughs> but I don't think I really don't think they've decided yet. You're lucky 13th, then it'll be the 14th season of the show. This spring marked the publication of Love, Loss, and What We Ate, her memoir, which hit the New York Times bestseller list. Congratulations. Yeah. Padma is also the co-founder of the Endometriosis Foundation of America, a not-for-profit dedicating to helping the millions of women who suffer from the disease. Not everyone knows about what that part of, about what it is. Well, which, thank God you started it. I mean, you. you've really brought a lot of attention to a disease that's very, very misunderstood. Um, you might also spy Padma in your grocery store's frozen food section. She has a line of premium side dishes called Padma Zizi Exotic that includes everything from Madras lemon rice to curried lentils. And she's a mom. She's a great cook. She's a great beauty. And as I like to say, she's my favorite Spice Girl. <laughs> which is why, <laughs> which is why we're here tonight. So I'm sure everybody saw this beautiful book. I'm sure a lot of you have it in your hands, and we'll get it signed later. Um, this is really a remarkable book, and such a. I mean, you're a celebrity. Celebrities don't always do really serious scholarly books like this. How did tell us how this came about? Um, I think I got. Um, I started becoming known because of spices and my knowledge of them because uh, I just wrote a little cookbook and then, you know, the reason that I started doing the series on um, the Food Network was because of me going on there just to publicize my book. So um, in my case, you know, I hate that word celebrity, but... Um, but my celebrity actually comes from spices. Uh, so everything I am, I owe to spices, I guess. I don't know. I just wanted to do this book because I always wanted to have a book like this. I um, love cookbooks, and um, I have these tomes that are called the Cambridge History of Food that literally are hard to lift. And um, I wanted a reference book that wasn't hard to lift, but was really useful and could be um, a place where cooks and food lovers could go just to have a straightforward explanation of everything. And you know, since I was a little girl, I've been explaining what Indian spices are to everyone. And then as I traveled, I had other people explain what their spices were to me because I always um, loved spices. So. This book is really a labor of love. I've I've wanted to do this book a, for a long time. Um, you know, I think it's a place for all this information to go. There were a lot of spices that I learned about in doing the book, and um, I'm really really proud of the hard work that I and um, Judith Sutton actually did on this book. She um, did amazing amounts of research, and you know it. Um, it's kind of daunting when you put encyclopedia on the cover of a book that has your name on it, so I'm still a little anxious that we forgot a spice that exists and that we haven't found yet, but um, I guess hopefully that will be addition too. But I just, um, I just wanted everyone to know how extraordinary these ingredients are because, um, you know, in a little mighty tiny little bead of heat is this peppercorn or this clove and, you know, spices are amazing. You can, if you know about the origin of a spice, you can tell a lot about the place it comes from and it's history and its healing properties and the climate of that culture. And I think the thing that defines one culture's food uh, from another is the spices that you add to those basic proteins and vegetables and starches, right? Every culture has butter and oil. Every culture has uh, animal and vegetarian protein. You get the drift, you know? So like, if you just change the spices that you put on your food, you change the culture. And it's spices that define what kind of dish any dish in the world you're eating is. 
So when Padma told me she was doing this book, I was the thing that excited me most is that not only did she work with Judith, but she also worked with Calustians. Has, has anybody been there to the shop? If, <laughs> hi. If you haven't been there and you love food, it, I, I'll let Padma describe it. It's really. It's my favorite store in the world, other than the Strand. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I, I just, I grew up in that store. The store opened in 1944. My uncle, who is almost 85, used to go to that store when he first came here in the 60s. And my mother took me to that store in the 70s when I was, you know, gosh, even younger than my daughter, who's six, you know, like four. And um, now I take my daughter there. And it is just like a Disneyland of spices, but not only spices of salts, of rices, of lentils, of funky things that you've never heard of, but, uh, <laughs> but suddenly want to try. And, and they're very good at, you know, if they don't have something, sourcing something. And so if you've never been there, it is a real New York institution. Um, it's at 123 Lexington, you know, um, and it's, I always remember that address. Now they're also 125 and 127, they've expanded. But when, when I was a child, you know, they were very generous with me and they, you know, have some bulk foods and so they hand children candy and, 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 you know, whatever and, and, and dates and, and nuts and stuff. And it's just extraordinary. And it is an, it is a store that is very inspiring to me. If you don't have the money to travel, you can travel with your palate, and if you don't have much time to go anywhere to do that, just go to Calustians. It will open up a world to you and really revolutionize your cooking. And anytime you can't find an ingredient, go there, yeah. We couldn't find a dried mango powder that was in one of your Calustians. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we sent someone off there to get it. Yeah. Um, you know, when I think we were talking about your first cookbook, which came out in 1999. Yeah. And you said something really interesting about how the world has kind of caught up with how you eat. And when you look at the trends today, you know, my cousin's here and she will laugh at the story. But when I was growing up in New York City, my family did not use spices at all in our food. We were a ketchup family, pizza, <laughs> hot dogs. And the most telling story is my mom would get the El Paso taco box <laughs> to make because we had taco night once a week oh, and she, taco seasoning. She would throw it away. She oh, would no. throw away. <laughs> <laughs> my well, mother, just as well, it probably had MSG, but yeah. <laughs> my mother would throw away the spice packet. So that can tell that tells you how I grew up. So I am super grateful that this book exists because mm -hmm. my childhood was not one filled with spices and herbs like Padma's was. If you've read her um, memoir, I found the most evocative parts to be about her childhood and growing up and and picking, you know, pods from the tamarind trees. And you, your food and and culinary education began so early. Can you talk a little bit about your childhood in India and the things you learned? Sure. I mean, I think I always really love to cook because I have a really strong sense of smell. And so that sense of smell, well, that's most of your taste, right? It's also most of your palate. So I think that sense needed to be stimulated and was curious. It's, I guess, like, you know, somebody who has perfect pitch and becomes musical because they just have an affinity for it. I think that's where it started. But also I was surrounded by all these smells and textures and seeds and pods and twigs and these, you know, jars and, and the, the, the kitchen in my grandmother's house um, was really like the holy grail. Like, you were only allowed to sit in certain parts of the kitchen. It's not very big, you know, it's probably the size of this carpet, but like literally six of us were in there, and there was a real hierarchy to what you were allowed to touch and what you were allowed to do at what stage. And so for me, that, like we weren't allowed, children for obvious reasons, weren't allowed to touch the chili powder bottles or the, you know, hold the peppercorns or whatever. So to me, all of those ingredients w had magic and, and it meant you were a big girl and then it meant you had matured as a woman and, and, and you know, you, you 
I still haven't gotten the exact spike. I mean, I have now, but for years, like well into my 30s, I never got the exact recipe to the curry powder that my grandmother makes because, you know, I never became of marriageable age. <laughs> you know, I mean, I did, but I wasn't like, I wasn't in the system, so to speak. And so, like, I started making, you know, you get to make tea for the family when you're a teenager, when you wear a half sari and you, you know, go through puberty. And then you got to make dosas when you kind of went to college. And then, you know, so they were like this whole little, um, like, a, like a French kitchen has a hierarchy. You know, you start out as a commis, and then you become a garmanger, and then you go as a saucier, and you're sous chef, and, you know, you, you do the boucherie and whatever. It's the same thing, except my grandmother was a little meaner sometimes. <laughs> you know? um, I love my grandmother, but she was tough. And so, and she's a really good cook. And so when she saw, though, that I had an affinity for it, you know, she would often look the other way or teach me a lot about it. And that's really, really where it started. And, and you know, it's such a... For me, I look at the world through um, food and through my senses. I am naturally a very um, sense-oriented person. I, you know, some people are visual, some people... I am all my senses, so, like, I can remember how things sound, like the sound of frying... Anyone who's Indian would know this. The sound of frying mustard seeds in hot oil when they pop, like popcorn. And, you know, the curry leaves that you put in at the end that sizzle, and that smell, that smell of frying curry leaves is the one thing that will take any Indian back to whatever first home they were in. And, and so those things, you know, because I have a very strong sense of smell, it made an impression on me. And also, I, um, I, I have taste buds. I have a super taster, which I now found out. And I won't harp on that. I, Padma is very proud to be a super taster. I am. I am. I so like, that. but uh, you can, you can have, you can, uh, detect nuances in things. And so if you can detect nuances in things, it becomes more interesting to you. And so I think all these spices um, and all these flavors were a natural pull for me. You know, it's not because, like, I love sous vide or, you know, if you saw me chop an onion, you'd be highly unimpressed. It's, but it's, my cooking is taste-based, you know? It's really like how something feels in your mouth, you know, when you crush that peppercorn, or how does your tongue throb when you have that chili, or, the, you know, or that, that menthol taste when you actually exhale after chewing cloves. You know, those things have imprinted themselves on me in a very um, visual way, you know, in the way that, like, some musicians will see notes and colors. And, you know, not to put a fine point on it, but that's really where I'm happiest. I'm happiest, um, you know, kind of pottering um, and doing things like that and making chutneys. I love to make a new funky chutney or a new spice blend. So that's really how it happens, and, and all of us in my family are like that. You know, we, my aunts and my, my mom, we're all, my, my, my mother is the chutney master of, you know, Southern California. Nobody knows this, but if you go to a sleepy little street in La Puente, <laughs> you like these magical chutneys coming out of there. <laughs> so uh, when I saw you, I guess it was a few months ago, you just finished filming the finale yes. of Top Chef. Do people know where it was? Yeah, yeah, we announced it. Mexico. Yeah, yeah. yeah and so. you were so excited because you brought all these spices back. Mm -hmm. and ricados, ricados. Mark my words. Ricados are the next big trend. R what's a ricado? Ricado is um, the Mexican version of like garam masala or ras al hanout. It is often wet often sold at food markets and made by housewives in a ball like a like a dark like mud ball and it's like their curry powder but it also has mashed um garlic and, and other dark, dark spices. And you can put it in stews, or you can take a pinch and just mix it with a little oil or butter and toss rice with it. Or you could saute vegetables or potatoes with it. Often they will grind pumpkin seeds, because they have a lot of calabasa squash in that part of Mexico, in, in, in Merida and Guadalajara and stuff. And it's wonderful. And nobody, you know, we know 
very basic Mexican food and it's sort of like the, you know, guac and the now it's, you know, we're getting better at, because we have the corn with the cheese, which why do we need more fattening, you know, but anyway, but you get my drift. Mexican street corn. Yeah. Yeah. You were blown away by the similarities between all the Indian spices, like what you just mentioned. Yes. But, but between the spices and the pulses and everything. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one good thing about doing this book as well, and traveling. You know, if I had to give any young person one piece of advice for anything, being a good writer, a good cook, a good civilian, a good anything, I would say to travel. You know, the first time you get some money, you know, don't buy something fancy. Buy a plane ticket to anywhere you can afford to go and just explore, you know, because it, I could never have done this book if I hadn't spent my life traveling like a gypsy, whether it was, you know, between India and America or as a model or, or as an actress or whatever. And I think that, um, what was your question? <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> you could just see what you were saying is beautiful. You were you came back from Mexico and you were struck by the similarities. Oh between yes, Mexico yes, yes. Well, India. you know, if yeah. it, if you look at South America and in Asia or Mexico and India specifically, they both have roughly the same climate, right? So you have the same ingredients. You have mango. You have sugar cane. You have coconut. You have cumin. You have citrus fruit. You have chilies. You have tamarind. Right? All these ingredients ingredients and the the cumin was brought there by the Spanish and the Spanish got it from the Moors when they came up from North Africa you know like that whole Sevilla and the whole like Al Andalus the Islamic period and so that's a great thing about spices too you can trace the history of the world through the spice route and so I was struck by how similar actually like regional authentic Mexican food and Mayan food, which uses a lot of pulses and grains, is to Indian food because of the ricottos. I mean, ricotto is just a wet garam masala. I mean, there's some different things. Then you go to Turkey and you see baharat. Baharat is a beautiful spice blend and it's really warm and it has cinnamon and coriander and it's beautiful rubbed on meats, but it's also great in your meatballs or meat kebabs and, and baharat is the curry powder of Turkey. Same with Ras Al Hanout, which is the spice blend from Morocco. You see where I'm going with this, and called the king of spices, or the top of the shelf of spices. And it can have like four ingredients or 20, and each family or spice shop will tell you, no, this is wrong, that's the way to do it. And, and so on and on and on, and you have these, you have togarashi, you have, you know, every culture has this, but specifically, those cultures, South American and, and Asian cultures, do have much more in common because of their similarities of ingredients. So the timing of this book is so perfect because, you know, I mentioned ketchup earlier, and it's so interesting now to see salsas, sriracha, hot sauce really overtaking ketchup, you know, when you talk to people about yeah, supermarket trends. I mean, can trends. you imagine? Are you happy the world has caught up to Yes, what I am into? so elated because now I don't have to go, um, what is now uptown for me, to go to to get, you know, sriracha. Everybody has sriracha. Like, my bodega has sriracha. Um, and it's wonderful. I'm waiting for Whole Foods to carry curry leaves because, to me, the day... Because they, listen, they managed to carry fresh turmeric. No Indian store on the eastern seaboard can, even has, like, now they do. But, you know, am I right? Like, who knows this? Who goes to Indian grocery stores, right? And now, all of a sudden, we're having margaritas with turmeric in them. So, you know, this is the power of um, stores. And this is the power of travel and the internet. And it's very exciting because all of a sudden, the world is a much bigger place and a much smaller place at the same time. And to me, spices are magical because they don't have many, cal they hardly have any calories. It's easy to make something taste good if you're throwing a bunch of fat in it, if you're putting bacon or butter or oil. But spices are healthy for you, so having them in your life makes it, makes it more healthy, not less healthy. And, you know, it can actually make eating healthy or virtuous more 
appetizing and more enticing. And they last forever in your shelf. The Spice Council of the world, like, Amer is there a Spice Council of America? I want them to hire me because I'm just like, because uh, I'm singing a gospel I really, truly have, you know. But you get my point. Like, they have an, a great shelf life, right? They don't spoil. They don't cost very much. And if you just know, you probably don't, we, most of us probably don't use everything, like, even half of what's in our spice rack. By the way, don't keep your spices in a spice rack. I know it looks really pretty, especially over your stove. Does anyone do that? No way. Thank you, not here. Because a lot of people do that, and I used to do that when I was in college. And the heat from the spices deteriorates the quality of spices. I did that until I had a kitchen fire, like a grease fire on the stove where I went, <laughs> you know, uh, it's quite I started, stunning. I started putting the date I buy the spice on a little piece of tape on the uh, spice thing because you know how it is. You buy so many spices and then you make a recipe that calls for, I don't know, pick a spice. And you're baharat. like, you're like Did I? I don't have baharat in my, in my cabinet, but I will after this. You should. I'm going to make you a starter kit. But you know how it is. You follow a recipe and you're like, okay, mm -hmm. did I buy the spice three years ago or did I buy the spice six months ago? And that tells you two things. You need to put a date on your spice, but you also need to use your spices more. Yeah. 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 And also, you don't, like, people get, um, they get intimidated, they get overwhelmed because they think they need, because every recipe they've seen has seven spices in them. So they think they need to put a whole bunch of spices. But I say, if you're not familiar with spices or certain kind of spices, you know, from a certain area, just buy a spice blend. I just named five that are there because the mixing is for uh, done for you and done by people who use it all the time. If you want to really experiment with spices, I say use one spice at a time. Okay, anything. Pick allspice, which is not a spice blend, but little berry. And or or pick sumac, which is a berry that grows in the Middle East and also here it used to grow in America. The Native Americans used to use it for cough syrup and a refreshing tonic. Um, the Romans used it as a souring agent. It's got this beautiful vermilion color because they hadn't discovered citrus fruit in India yet and all these things. So um, just try to use one thing. Like if, if you're using sumac and you're not familiar with it, it's got a tart taste and a gritty flavor. So dust your French fries with it along with salt, and you won't need the malt vinegar to make your French fries soggy, for instance. Or you know, get um, herbs of Provence and just make a compound butter with it. Just melt. Just use room temperature butter. Mash it together. Put it in a ramekin put it in your fridge, and just fling a little pad of it in the frying pan and use it for everything from your hash browns to your sauteed green beans. So start small with one spice and just add it to a dish you already know how to make and see what it does to that dish. And then move on until you're comfortable. And that's a great way, you know, it's like listening to one song from Led Zeppelin and then liking that song and then taking it in the car with you. It's the same thing. You know, along those lines, I wanted to ask, how do you recommend people use this book? Bedtime reading? <laughs> I want you to read it cover to cover. I, you know, um, I read, I read uh, cookbooks cover to cover, actually. Um, well, I think I would love you guys just to put it on your shelf in your kitchen. I hope that the book is splattered with food and dog-eared and bookmarked and, you know, I hope... You know, that's why we made it the dimensions it is. I hope it's not too heavy to go in your luggage when you go to some foreign market, you know, in, in the Middle East or in Asia, and that, you know, you can look stuff up, stuff up. Or if you go to a store, you can say, where is this? And so, you know, I wanted the book to be really just user friendly. And so that's why we said, like, use it with these meats or these proteins. These are the dishes that have them, et cetera. Because I want this to be like a manual. I don't want it to be something pristine that, you know, there are other books for that. <laughs> what is your favorite spice? That's a hard one. Um, I mean, it's, the obvious one is obviously sambar powder, madras sambar powder. 
Um, I'm partial to 777 brand. It's a brand that's in my hometown of Chennai, and it's this like fourth generation little family. It's all they make, and I tried to buy the company. <laughs> they wouldn't let me. I mean, they wouldn't even say how much, you know? <laughs> like, they were like, go away. We, who are you? Um, and, um, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, probably Sumac is a, a wonderful one that I really love. Um, and, you know, gosh, it's hard. It's hard to pick. What's the spiciest thing you've ever eaten? Oh, my God. Um, I cried recently. Like, I cried, and I was sorry I ate it because it really, I thought it, I was going to have a blister on my tongue. It was this powder, this chili powder. Um, we were shooting the book, and it was just awful. I don't know. <laughs> It was awful. I don't, I, I'm not one of those people that like needs to, you know, test myself about how hot I can take it. I used to do that in other ways when I was in my 20s, but now no more. <laughs> That's another book. <laughs> <laughs> and for people like me who didn't grow up on mm -hmm. spicy food, I'm sure there are some of you out there who haven't been so spice uh, forward. Um, what's, how do you start to try spicy and spicier and spicier? Well, this is the thing. Hold on. Because people assume that spices are spicy, right? So Great point. So, yes. you know, cur curry powder, a lot of people will say, oh, I don't, I don't like curry powder because I don't like spicy food. There are, a, you can get a cornucopia of cor curry powders from hot to very mild. And I recommend the mild. For instance, I have a child at home, and she eats much more than most children. But, you know, still, she has a young stomach, and I want to protect it. So we use a very mild curry powder in my house, and then we just add chilies. Um, and recently, she's taken to, you know, asking for the chili flakes, too, which sometimes works out and sometimes doesn't. But because that feels glamorous to her, which I'm happy about, because that's exactly what happened my grandma's kitchen with me but um so hot food hot food like you could you, what's the gateway drug you know actually capsaicin is very addictive you know it is that's scientifically proven it's more addictive than pot i just want to say that um and 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 you start small you, you like there are chilies chili powders you can try like there's two middle eastern ones that i love one is urfa u-r-f-a chili which has a lot of oil content it comes from turkey and so when they're usually never you never see it whole they actually grind it, it doesn't have a lot of seeds but it has a lot of oil so when it's dried it almost fries or or smokes a little the oil smokes out of the chili and so it, the chili is a mild chili but it has a smoky flavor and it's really wonderful especially if you're just doing like flank steak you just put that on there with sea salt it's fabulous another one is aleppo which is hard now because obviously with the trouble going on in syria it's named after the town of aleppo uh, the town of aleppo that's another one so you start small and i guarantee you i've had like you know anthony's back there he just started working with us at the um Hi, Anthony. <laughs> he just started, he's one of our assistants in the office, and he just started working with us like less than a year ago. And he has confessed to me that he now eats spicier food than he did when he came to you know, work with us. And Caroline, is that true for you too? Where's Caroline? It is true. Look, look how blonde and patrician Caroline is. <laughs> she eats such spicy food now. And so it is addictive. And I don't think it needs much of um, a gateway drug. I do say that you should always buffer your stomach. Like there are all these ingredients in Indian curry blends that you don't taste. And for years, I used to fight with my grandma and be like, well, why do I need it? You know, and she said, because there's a reason that it's there that you may not know, but it's there, like fenugreek. You're shaking your head, yes, yeah. But you have to use certain spices to balance others. And so you'll, you'll feel that. And this book will help you. Because every spice, if it has a medicinal use, it's also written there. Like, you know, in the olden days when we didn't have a lot of medicines, we would use turmeric for asthma. Um, and so you just put a little bit of the powder in boiling water. And, you know, just like the Vicks Vapor Rub, we would give that. We'll also give it in hot milk and, and things like that. So also like ginger. Ginger is an anti-nausea. So like when, you know, if, if you're pregnant and you have morning sickness, you, you, can't, you don't want to take a Dramamine, obviously. So, you know, 
ginger, they always say to chew on a piece of ginger or candy ginger if it's too sharp. And so there are a lot of things. This, this stuff exists for centuries and millennia in Ayurvedic medicine, in Chinese medicine. You know, we always talk about balancing. And so, you know, I think just there's a world of fun and exciting um, things that will affect your body and your palate and your mood in miraculous ways. And I, didn't, I, I think a gateway drug is just to start with a little bit extra black pepper and go to the red chili and keep going and going and going. But you don't have to go to the scorpion pepper or the Carolina Reaper. I can't remember which, but one of those powders is what I like. Literally, I you know licked my finger and I put it in there, almost like a stupid, like, childish move to test myself, and it was dumb. You know, it's not, so don't do that. So should we take some questions from the audience? Sure. Oh, I have a microphone for whomever you choose. Does anybody have a question? OK. Hi, ladies. Hi. Um, when I first met you a million years ago, you had, I think you had just written Easy Exotic, is that? Yeah, right? yeah. And exactly. of course, of those of you who don't know Padma, I mean, and you can tell her authenticity, it was quite extraordinary to meet someone who was not only drop dead beautiful, but had written a book that was a serious cookbook. It wasn't easy ways to invent, I mean, it's a real, real cookbook, and we all used it, and I still use it. Um, I'm wondering, I have a, more, a broader question than about spice. I'm wondering, both of you actually, your opinion on um, how everyone in the world has become a foodie in the past oh. uh, 15 years. I mean, there are those of us who have done it our whole lives. I mean, yeah. as you know, you know, you and I bonded over that, you and I both. I'm just curious. I mean, in some ways it's fabulous. What's your general opinion on that? I think it's great because it just means more people will try sumac or whatever it is. That's how I really feel. That's officially how that's officially what I feel. But there is this little bitchy part of me that <laughs> is like, okay, fine, but it's just food and you know, I know you know how to do all these filters and you can make your hot dog look so juicy that I just want to like pick it up and eat it and I get it and I try to do that with my cookbooks and it's fine. I kind of love it and I can't help but roll my eyes at it sometime. It's true. I don't roll my eyes at that stuff. I actually more roll my eyes when people like go to all these like super duper fancy restaurants and they throw around these names and like I didn't know chefs names. I'll be honest until I went and started hosting Top Chef. I didn't. I'm sorry. I knew cookbook authors. I knew Jacques Pepin. I knew, you know, but I didn't know who Thomas Keller was. I would have, you know, until the second half of my life, I would have never been able to afford like a piece of bread at Thomas Keller's restaurant. So, and I think that's true for most people. But now people are talking about Danny Rose and this and that. And, and that's great. But it's just like food has become so fetishized in our culture. And it's just you know, another, um, it's the sex of today's media in a way that is um, non-threatening, you know? And I think that's actually also, and my show has a lot to, you know, take the blame for that for, but um, I also think, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the one thing you can do with everyone you know because every creature on the planet eats. And it's one of the few things you can watch with your family. Um, you'd be surprised how many 13-year-old fans I have because of Top Chef. I was once mobbed at a bar mitzvah <laughs> at Temple Emmanuel. Yeah, uh, you know what I mean? And it was cool, it was great. I felt like Justin Bieber. But you know, but so, you know, obviously I can't knock it too much because it provides a nice lifestyle for me and my daughter, but um, you know, it's just the thing of today. It's what sports used to be. <laughs> I mean, what sports still is, but I mean, other than the Knicks, not at my house. <laughs> Oh, one and two. Yeah. Hi, Padma. Thank you, first of all, for writing this book. Um, as a kid who grew up in an Indian household, not in New York City, I was eating the weird, stinky, smelly food that nobody yeah. understood. And so this is, I think, having something like this out there, it's very personal. 
but it's also so practical, and I don't cook, so maybe I will now. Oh, okay. <laughs> there we go. Thank you for this. Really? Are, uh, are you Indian? Surprise. <laughs> I am. Yeah, Gujarati. Uh, you're yeah. Gujarati and you don't cook? I know. Haram. I know. <laughs> Gujarati food. Indian food is much more regional than you realize, mm -hmm. you know? It's like Europe under one kind of dysfunctional, dysfunctional but de democratic government. Yeah. And Gujarati food is so vegetable-based and so... Um, varied and really subtle, and you should really learn to cook. <laughs> <laughs> really, you, you really. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you like to eat, you know, I'm happy I you have the eat. book. <laughs> and um, I thank you for getting it because, yeah. you know, she comes from a great food culture. There's this beautiful kite festival in Ahmedabad, in the capital of Gujarat, and everybody awesome. is on their roofs and they fly kites and they leave all the doors open. And I have been there. Mm. Um, my friend Apu is is from oh. you know Ahmedabad and his mother Kinnery is a beautiful woman and a wonderful cook and she lives in this old Haveli house these old Muslim houses with tile and everything anyway all the women in the town leave their doors open there's nothing you could do in New York City but um, and they cook huge amounts of food and you go from house to house to fly your kites from different roofs and eating different foods and there are like 15 vegetable dishes and six lentil dishes and you know it's it's a beautiful beautiful and it's mostly vegetarian it has meat too but it has such a variety of flavors and 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 foods in in Gujarati cooking it's it's really beautiful you're in trouble and you didn't even ask your question I had no yet. idea I'm sorry I'm <laughs> sorry I was like, I've never introduced like, you to I, my mom I'm saying that because I wish I knew more about Gujarati food I know oh. enough about it but I yeah. really would love to I, it's not in the cards anytime soon but I would love to just go mm -hmm. and be in, in Ahmedabad for three weeks because Ahmedabad also is a Muslim town mm -hmm. and so you have a lot of that beautiful old old Muslim culture in it Lucknow is another city like that in India North India mm -hmm. and I didn't grow up in you you know, I grew up in the South, and I, I certainly didn't grow up in a Muslim home, and yeah. and so it's interesting for me. Yeah, I know you have an open invitation to my mom's kitchen anytime you want. Where does she <laughs> live? Road trip to Rhode Island. I will come to Rhode Island. <laughs> so actually, my, my question for you was, um, I know you used to be vegetarian, yeah. so I'm just wondering how uh, transitioning to eating meat changed your palate. Um, I think it deadened, not deadened, but I think it did... Um, weigh my palate down, mm -hmm. you know. Um, it, I, I was raised in a Brahmin household, which is a lacto-vegetarian home, but, you know, I came here when I was four, so I really went to school mostly in America, except for a couple of years, but um, I didn't start eating meat until, you know, I was probably like a preteen, and then like, you know, yeah, freshman year I was eating hamburgers, you know, but I didn't start eating fish until I was in my early 30s when I lived in Italy, I, you know. Yeah, I spent a long time in Italy, and sort of the second half of that I started, you know, first with shrimp and things that don't really, you know, have any flavor, and then you go whole hog or whole whale, whatever, you know, the metaphor <laughs> is. But, um, it's hard, I think, yeah. you know, but, but good meat is really delicious. I still don't naturally, I don't have a natural proclivity mm -hmm. towards meat. I, you know, in the dead of winter, one time I'll usually make a huge pork shoulder or something, and I enjoy doing it, mm -hmm. but um, it doesn't occur to me. I mean, obviously on the show, I'm very omnivorous, and I have to eat the funkiest things, yeah. as anyone who's seen the show knows. There's always that fear factor episode, you know? I'm just bracing myself. But, um, but you know, in my own life, um, my daughter and I eat mostly plant-based. You know, we have a lot of chicken, a lot of fish, and I do eat veal, you know? But, um, you know, it's, I'm never going to order a steak, nor am I going to bring a big ribeye to cook at home. You know, I might do ribs once a year if we're having a big party, and I know that'll be... A, popular or someone, you know, who's who's with me eating. I know he likes ribs or something, but otherwise it's not it's not something that comes to me naturally yeah. still. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Since you need to learn how to cook, if I can put in a plug for Padma's two cookbooks. They're really she, she doesn't like to call herself a chef. She'll never say that. Yeah, she's yeah, a, not a chef. she's an enthusiastic home cook, <laughs> but her recipes are so beautifully written. And so easy to follow. And if you know, if you're not used to making that kind of food, she makes it really easy for you to do it. So, 
Just Thank a little you. plug for you. Thank you. So. I know. <laughs> she she asked me for some recipes for cherry bomb, which is, you know, I admire cherry bomb so so much and so I was like yeah take it however many you want and then I recently saw her and she was like oh your recipes really work like she was surprised <laughs> <laughs> because most chefs recipes don't I mean by the time they get into a cookbook they do but you know chefs don't write recipes for home cooks it's they not, a lot of them just don't they, write yeah it's not what they at do, all you know so, yeah but Padma is different so you're next your question Thank you. hi good evening Padma hi. It, it's an honor to meet you. I first watched you Thank on you. Planet Food 14 years ago when wow. I was in high school. I think I saw the Spain episode, Italy, Spain. and yeah, India. India. So it's it's, incre it's like a dream come true. You made oh, my birth <laughs> this is my birthday week, by the way. So thank Happy you. Happy birthday! <laughs> thank you. Happy birthday! Thank you. And as a self-proclaimed foodie and one who lived in a spice world, um, who's grown even more fonder of spices and just looking to make my meals more extraordinary. So I look forward to reading your encyclopedia and the uh, memoir. But my question to you is, you've talked so much about your favorite spices, and, and, and your knowledge is truly breathtaking, but w what is your least favorite spice? Or do you have a least favorite spice? Uh, I'm trying to think. <laughs> if I don't like it, I don't use it. But Coleman's mustard kind of, <laughs> that's a tough one, man. And I love mustard seeds, right? But I'm just, that's, that's hard. Like I also, um, I recently filmed this uh, other show that you know, we're working on and um, there, was a, there was like this Russian roulette at this restaurant downtown where you get five dumplings and one of them is stuffed. Does anyone know the restaurant I'm talking about? All with wasabi. Oh. Yeah, see that, I why, thought the why? same thing, but it's actually popular, I don't understand. So wasabi I would use in really small doses too. Like I don't, I'm not, I don't need my nasal passages cleared. I think we have time for one more question. Any other questions? Can we do two? Yeah, we can do two. Um, like everyone's echoed here, it's wonderful to meet you, Padma. It's I, I've seen you in Top Chef, and now to actually, when you walked in, I was like, whoa, she's actually in front of me. This is, it's 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 really awesome. Um, and it, when you started talking about how you cooked with spices when you were growing up, I actually had the opposite reaction where I hated st standing next to my mom. I grew up in an Indian household. I didn't like doing that. I felt it was just boring and it just was I was like I want to go outside and play I didn't want to do any of that um, but when I went to undergrad I finally was like let me try to make um, I grew up in a Mount Ashton household and try to make just a potato um, vegetable and it was I was like why we can just put all the spices and the things all together and why is it not tasting like it's supposed to taste and you didn't watch your mom I, yeah <laughs> and then I, and then that's what I realized I realized I didn't watch my mom and then it actually kind of started clicking where you put the spices first and starting to smell those aromas and hearing when you said the rye crackle that mm -hmm, mustard mm -hmm. seed all those senses it was kind of awakened and that just made cooking a lot more enjoyable. Um, so I really was resonating with that. So I really appreciate hearing you say that. Um, my question for you is, I've been a fan of Top Chef forever and ever and ever. I just wanted to know if you had a special moment or favorite time of Top Chef in your years and decades um, over Top Chef, what kind of stood out to you? What was your favorite time? Oh gosh, there's so many moments. I think w when we were in Texas, Texas was a hard season for me. It nearly killed me because um, you know, we moved, every, if you saw the season, we moved every week and, you know, I, I was still nursing at the time and so like, like, talk about like living like a gypsy, so we had to like pack up and then go to Dallas and then pack up and go to Austin and, you know, all that stuff. So, but in Texas we had this one magical dinner in, in San Antonio with, I think, Char with Charlize Theron who was you know, publicizing uh, Snow White and the Huntsman or whatever, and we were like, how are we gonna work this movie into it? Because we have to, right? That's why Universal has flown her to here, you know, all this stuff, so I'm like, okay. So we did this thing where we said, tell us a story on the plate. You know, do like a fairy tale, outlandish fairy tale dish. And we had this magical dinner um, where Paul Key, who wound up winning the season, literally took a, a hand, luckily it was gloved, dipped it in beet juice and put a hand, bloody handprint on the plate. And then 
dressed it with these beautiful little edible flowers and, and crispy fried things. And the plate looked beautiful, like Michelle Bra, for anyone who wants to throw the chef name around. Michelle Bra is a French chef who has influenced every person who's working today, from Tom Colicchio to Thomas Keller on down. And he was known uh, for many things, but also the way he played it. It's very, you know, it's very Michelle Bra, they say. It's like an artist. You would be able to tell a Jackson Pollock, right? So, um, so Paul Key did that. And then somebody else, Beverly, who is a Chinese chef, did a black chicken claw. You know, it was wild. And it was so beautiful. And it inspired all of us to talk about the food in as, in as uh, descriptive as we could, but in also a fantastical way. Like, you would read the words. We did it naturally without meaning to. And I think that's a special thing about Top Chef, you know, very quickly, that, you know, on the voice, you can hear if someone's a good singer. On Project Runway, you can see the dress. But on our show, you're really relying on us to communicate out loud the experience of that dish and what it tastes like and what it feels like in our mouth. And you know, there's also a drinking game, by the way, that my <laughs> Do you know the drinking game? Does anyone know the drinking game? There's a drinking game that um, a lot of my producers play. And then Andy Cohen talked about it. The, you know, and he does it on his show with the word like, Every time I say in my mouth, they get to drink because, you know, it's while something. You're, while you're filming, they're drinking. Yeah, they're not that. drinking while I'm filming. It's such long hours. You know, we it's sad because we do get to drink because um, some of us more than others. But, like, you know, it, I don't drink that much because I have a very to low tolerance. But it's hard not to absentmindedly sip wine. You have to have wine when you're having some of these beautiful meals. And wine is a part of a lot of the challenges. So, anyway. So last question oh, in the back. Hi. Um, so I just read your book, Tangy, Tart, Hot, and Sweet. And I really enjoyed it because I felt like it was a buddy helping me through these different kinds of cuisines all over the world. And um, I know that you've lived in many different places and had many different food experiences. I was curious, is there a food experience you have yet to have that you really would love to have? I haven't eaten balut, and I don't know if I would love to eat balut. Do you know? Does anyone you know what I don't you're know you know? Okay. Is it? I, you know, it's it's scary. Just that that balut is. Hey, tell them what balut is, so I don't. Oh, thank you. So balut, it's like a like a fermented duck embryo egg. And when you crack it, I mean, it's, it's, it's not, like, not like a regular egg. I mean, you have to crack it from the top real gently. Once you gently peel off the shell, then the first thing you see is a duck's head. Yum. And <laughs> I was going to say that, too. But when I show it, from personal experience, when I've showed it to my friends, about 99% of them will just start like, whoa. Maybe 5% will actually dive into it and eat it. But honestly, it's good. It's a great source of protein. and. I mean, Philip. So, like Indian food, Filipino food is also making its way into the uh, culinary scene. Yes, Mahalika is a great restaurant downtown for, for Filipino food. And Jitney food. too. <laughs> and Jitney, yeah. Um, I also would really, you know. Well, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I would also the, traditionally you'll read about this in the spice book. Remember, I told you about all these spice blend Ras Al Hanout from Morocco. They used to make it with hashish. And I would love to I would love to have had the original recipe and cook with it and see what that's I'm I'm being honest. I'm just from a scientific point of view. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, thank you everybody for coming. This is a fun night.